your extraordinary life, Christian. I know, it sounds a little bit strange, extraordinary life. But if someone wants to suggest the alternative extra, extraordinary, it doesn't quite cover everything that we want to cover here. Let me explain. The, the X from, originally from back at the, the Greek preposition ek, and then the Latin preposition X means out of. Your out of the ordinary life, Christian. Think about that. In some ways, that description is reflective of how you will be seen as strange. Your the decisions and actions in life will be seen as strange to others who live for only this life here and now, that's all they have. Philippians chapter 3 explains, Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their God is their stomach. Their mind is set on earthly things. And 1 Peter goes on to explain, they think it strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of reckless living. You see, they don't know God's love. They don't know God's truth. They're being guided by human understanding and by human desires. You know God's truth. You know God's love in Jesus and you live for him in trust and with thanks. You see how different those two are, how those are two completely different worldviews for life. That will mean added pressure sometimes for you and even abuse sometimes for you from people of the world who don't know and understand God's truth. That's the number one insight we want to carry away, and I want to give you right away then a second insight. In other instances, the out of the ordinary life that you live, dear Christian, the peace that you have through Jesus, and the joy that you have because of that, and the, the love of God that comes pouring out from you to others, there are instances where that will bring positive attention from onlookers as well. And that points us, along with them, back to the foundation of all of that, all of this. And this is the, the third key insight that we want to carry away. The totally different view of life that you have, dear Christian, flows from the change of heart that God has brought about in you. 1 Peter chapter 2 says it this way, Proclaim the praises of him who called you out of, out of darkness, into his wonderful light. You are no longer in the darkness of, of the way that seems right to people, but in the end leads to death. You know the impossibility of pleasing God and getting right with God, being with God based on your own efforts. You know Jesus is the way. You know, Jesus' righteousness is yours through faith. You have him as your Savior. You are no longer on the broad road that leads to destruction. And though that is absolute truth, that doesn't mean it will go unchallenged. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles, but to you whom God has called Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Pull all these insights together. Your out of the ordinary life Christian will mean unique and sometimes very difficult challenges. But our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This, my friends, is just such an important topic for us to talk about together. Be encouraged. You're out of the ordinary life, Christian. God has brought this to you. And like God's people of old, praise God for this. Like we hear in Psalm 107, he brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love 
and his wonderful deeds for men. Let's give him our thanks as well. As we dig into Matthew chapter 10, we're going to especially focus in on verses 34 to 39, and we've got our first topic in our series then, your extraordinary, your out of the ordinary life, Christian. And that first topic is this, God above all. And along with that comes this, a sword and divide and a daily crucify. Can you remember those? A sword and divide and the daily crucify. Does that sound a little bit shocking? Let's dig in for comfort and for encouragement to love God above all. This is your word, Lord. Help us to hear it, to learn it, to, to take all that you impart to us here to, to heart Amen. Look around and you'll see it here in our great state of North Carolina. I'm talking about the house divided message. I've seen especially examples of this. It's riding along with vehicles. It's hanging from people's homes. And I've seen the variety that is Duke and UNC. That's popular, I know. I've seen also the one where it's NC State and UNC. It makes me think about another divide from back at the last place where my family lived prior to here in North Carolina. I remember being asked on the, the first official Sunday I was at the church there, red or green? Have I shared with all of you this before? If you're asked red or green in the state of New Mexico, what's that all about? Which chili do you prefer? Name it. Is it red chilies or green chilies? Come on back to the state of North Carolina, and we've got our own divide over culinary flair, right? I've heard that over in the West, it's tomato-based, and here in the East, it's vinegar that's favored. What am I talking about? Barbecue. There's all sorts of divides in life. The deeper question to answer is this, what's the issue about on which we differ? The teams we cheer for, the food that, the flavors of food that we prefer or like best, whether those kind of things are within a family or among friends or in a town, in most cases, examples like that bring up some good you know, fun rivalry, a bit of good-natured banter. Sometimes that gets a little bit intense, but usually not to the level of hostility. Although there have been times where things have gone south like that. For example, football, where I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, was a big deal. One year while I was growing up, the Wisconsin Badgers came into town, into the horseshoe, and they upset Ohio State. Well, the vicar at our church that year was from the state of Wisconsin and his vehicle had license, plate from, license plates from Wisconsin. And sadly, after that game, the air was let out of all of the tires of his car. Now, worse has been done certainly in sports rivalries, but such divides aren't always the source of hostility, though sometimes some individuals have such aggression. Well, if you remember back to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, this concept of a divide, even within families, is one of the key thoughts. And I've got, got three takeaways now that I want us to focus in on here. Number one, there is a divide present in our world, and you and I are on one side of that divide, and sometimes people from our own families even are on the other side of it. This doesn't mean there is always hostility and aggression, but such hostility is present. It, it does exist in our world. 
Listen again to some of Jesus' words. Do not think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. As Jesus talks about the divide, he also talks about a sword. Think about it. With God's word at work, by God's power and grace, people are cut away from the, the darkness and the dark prison of unbelief. And the chains of sin are cut away. They're brought into the, the light to stand in God's grace. They, we, are no longer divided then from our God. We stand in God's grace. We stand in God's peace. We're brought peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is wonderful. And we carry this, this news. We carry this good news of our God with us. It's precious to us, but sometimes it's met with hostility. You may, for example, hear from someone, even from a member of your own family. It's not good enough for you to say that you still love me and to say that I'm wrong. You have to give approval and acceptance to what I have in my life, whether that's a belief or that's a behavior that stands against opposed to God and against God's will. There's a reason Jesus warns us in verse 37, anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. As we talk about this topic then of love God, love God above all, here's the second takeaway that I want us to focus in on. What makes one worthy? We should really get to an answer for, for that as we hear Jesus talk about this topic of, of worthy here. First, it's important to see this. Worthy doesn't have to do with how well you do at anything. It's not based on your performance in any way. Jesus' descriptions here have everything to do with the question, in whom do you trust? Jesus is really hitting at this point. Who is your God? Is it others or is it the Lord? And there's nothing in Jesus' words here that would indicate that your relationship with him is based on how well you do at putting him first. No. He is simply pointing to the heart. He is simply getting at the question of, in whom do you trust? Who is your God? And with that, there is one more issue that Jesus leads us to address as we answer, who is your God? Along with the issue and the question of, is it others or is it the Lord? There's also this question, is it self or is it the Lord? You see, here is where we get at this, uh, the daily crucify of our key truth today. We, we've talked already about the divide in our world and that you and I have been cut away, brought into, brought out of darkness and brought into the light, cut away from the darkness of unbelief and brought into God's wonderful light. Now we have in front of us another truth to take to heart. There is an internal divide within each one of us. Think of that as you hear verses 38 and 39. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The cross that we carry 
includes the daily effort to crucify the sinful flesh. We are to, to set to we are to set out each day to destroy entirely the sinful self, to put to death its pull and its sway over us. And then to start the next day and do it all over again. And with that in view, circle back with me again to what makes one worthy. And see with me, this is why Jesus means everything to you and me. If worthy was in any way dependent upon our actions and how well we've done, where would we be? Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Think of how often that we have failed to deny self and to, to seek God's will over our own desires, to put God above all. All you or I have to do is to think about the many times that we have focused on self and our will rather than God's will. And again, you and I are back at this truth. Where would we be without Jesus? Jesus means everything to you and me. Jesus took up the only cross that brings our salvation. He paid everything in full for our forgiveness, for our sins with all of their punishment to be taken away. He did everything to bring our righteousness, His perfect life, credited to us through faith in Him. That's ours. We stand forgiven. We have peace with our God through faith in Jesus. This is our comfort. And this is our strength, our source of strength and reason to love God above all. This is part of your out of the ordinary, your, your extraordinary life, dear Christian. And this is reason for us to rejoice. Amen.